The Bark Show, everybody. My name is Pam, and I'm joined today by my lovely co-host, Susanna. Hi. So, it's a lovely sunny day in Toronto, and spring has finally arrived. Like, come on, guys, like last week, we're sitting here talking about the ice storm and how you're going to get through it with your dog. So, having the sunshine today, I'm sure there's not going to be many people joining us live because they're enjoying the sunshine with their doggos. So... We're going to continue anyway, and then hopefully you guys can catch up on the replay. So if you're watching the replay, go ahead and say hello, and you can join in at any time in the conversation because we will be coming back and checking in on things as we go along. So this show is brought to you by Toronto Dog Walking and I Speak Dog. The Bark Show is the place where we discuss all things dogs. So what are we going to talk about today? We have a good action-packed show in store. So hopefully we will stick to our hour of a lot of time, but generally we do always go over. So what we're going to go through today is nail trims for dogs and how they can quickly go wrong. How George Clooney used his dog to woo his wife, Amel Clooney. Dogs are more expressive when. When do you guys think dogs are more expressive? So we're going to go through a, a study telling us when dogs are more expressive. Sun's out. Dogs are out. And noticing a few different trends so we're going to talk more about that we have the lovely Bianca from Positive Pet Care joining us today and is going to talk to us about reactive dogs and give us some tips what reactive dogs are what works best for them so looking forward to that and at the end Susanna will take your dog training questions so if you guys have any questions about dog training any aspects any behavior questions go ahead right now and put them in the comment section and we will get to them at the end of the talk at the end of the show so, you guys, if you have any anything that you wanted us to talk about, if you want, if you have any like any kind of reactions to what we're talking about, we'd love to hear it because we love to hear what everybody everybody has to has to say about all things dogs. Because who doesn't love to talk all things dogs? And that's generally why we never stick to the hour a lot of time because we like to talk dogs an awful lot. So. Susanna has a little pet peeve that she wants to start off talking about today. So take it away, Susanna. Tell us about the horrible stuff that we're going to see on our screen now in a second. Yeah, honestly, prepare yourselves. Um, so David actually gave us this topic because a friend of his took his dog to one of the biggest, like largest pet uh, stores in Canada for a groom, as you can see on the screen, right? And um, it went terribly wrong. Um, the dog is scarred. Um, the owner is scarred for life right now too, right? Because like you're, they're supposed to be professionals. And this is what they came out with. Um, it, it's a little bit hard not to get passionate about these topics, you know, just because um, you're supposed to, they're supposed to be taking care of your pet there, right? And if you're anything like me, I have this irrational fear of cutting too close the dog's um, to to, to, to nerve, right? So after eight years of having my dog, Bella, I finally said to myself, you know what, she's fine. Let me kind of get over my fear of cutting their toenails as well, right? So I can uh, share some tips that I uh, put into my practice when it comes to this um, because this is not okay. Like I, I'm looking at the screen right now and it just it was not okay. Um, so nails outside or in a well-lit room and you know what I've had all lights in my living room turned on when I did this I also had a ton of treats just for my dog too, even though she's fine but I just always like to pair positive things with something that's aversive right if you need the cheaters for reading so like glasses use them for toenail clipping as well right so it's easier to see the nail structures on a pigment of nails than on white nails the insensitive nail will show as chalky ring around the sensitive quick Keep clipper blades almost parallel to the nail. Never cut across the finger, and, and this is super important to have in mind. Don't squeeze the toes. That also really hurts too. I know sometimes people get a little bit, you know, anxious or nervous about doing this. But if you squeeze their toenails, where people uh, uh, the fingernails while you're cutting their toenails, it's gonna get, get a reaction of a dog as well. Um, use your fingers to separate the toes for clipping, and then uh, hold their paw uh, very gently. Because again, you want this experience to be positive for you and for your dog as well. Use a pair of blunt edged children's scissors to remove excess toe hair, which is actually a really good tip. I did not know this until I actually researched it, because uh, nothing dog clippers uh, quicker than cutting uh, hair. Remember, no dog ever died from quickened um, toenail, 
So if you quick your dog accidentally, give a yummy treat right away. Make nail trimming really fun. Always associate nail cutting with cookies and trays. And for maintenance, cut every two weeks. To shorten, cut every week. Um, I was also going to say, like, we also have a dog training question in, in terms of um, cutting toenails. So we will mm-hmm. talk about that when uh, they get to our section um, of dog training questions. Um, yeah. Do you have anything to add when it comes to uh, dog nail cutting? Yeah, the only thing I would say is <clears throat> so many of us wouldn't be confident in cutting our dog's nails, which I think does not help the situation. Like, thank God I can't see too well, but I'm just going to put it on the screen here, like on its own, like the butchered job that was done at the at the grooming salon. Like, like her- people are doing them themselves, but like this is supposedly a professional who who showed this. Like, which is absolutely crazy. So, like, I, I'm terrified to do it. Like, and I went to do, like, a course on how to cut the nails and stuff. And I just don't do it myself. I prefer just to let my vet do it or she gets it done when she's gone to the groomers. Like, I don't know, does anybody out there groom their, or not groom, cut their own dog's nails? Because I'm sure, like, the more you do it, the more confident you're going to get. And your dog has positive associations. But... I can even imagine, say, it was myself, like, I would have, like, so much negative energy and, like, just be, like, she doesn't like to be touching her feet as it is, but I just, I think she would feed off my energy a lot and not be, not be comfortable with the situation. See, Bella, Bella was actually really fine. Kingsley, too. Kingsley, let me, uh, but I condition everything, right? So it's just, I've never before cut their toenails. So I literally went, I bought, like, things for it. I had special treats as well, but you know what? Kingsley was fine. Bella was fine. Katie was a little bit touchy because she's like, oh, you're touching my paws, but she was fine because she's very, mm-hmm. like, posy. She likes to slap me with her paws. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it, it was fine. Like, I, I felt like by the time I got to a third dog, I was like, okay, we're cool. I'm okay, you know, I'm not doing anything bad, but you're right. They could feed off our energy completely. And I was like a nervous, nervous wreck, even though my dogs are like, what's wrong with you? I think that's what they were thinking about me, right? Um, but yeah, for sure. Um, but Pam, I just wanted to, oh yes, please. Uh, before I even ask you for the next topic, honestly, mm-hmm. if you have, um, a bad experience, a bad experience. that happened to you with your dog or the groomers, or even if you butchered your dog's toenails, just let us know. Yeah, I'd love, I'd love to hear, but that's what, like, the worst part is, is that you sent your dog to what you thought was a professional to cut your dog's nails. That's the most... That's that's the worst part, is that's that, like, you send your dog there to go and get their nails done because you don't want to do it, so you're like, I'm going to send them to a professional. Yes. And they came back like that. Like, I can't, I cannot tell you how, like, leap and mad, like, I, like, that would upset me so much. I would be so angry that I would be, I can't, like, I would maybe show up myself in the store because I would be just so annoyed, like, what happened when they cut the nails? Like, did they just be like, okay, well, like, fob it off with the dog? Like, did they comfort the dog? Was the dog afraid? Like, there's just zero chance I would ever, ever, ever go back to, to that groomers. And I would tell everybody. I would tell everybody who would listen to me, do not go there. And I would be showing them the pictures of what happened to my dog because I would be, I would be so upset. So, funny story, the same head operation lost my dog Bella because she was four, mu- four months old when I took her there for the first woman appointment. Somebody didn't have her on a leash, and of course she's a puppy. She ran mm-hmm. out, and somebody opened the door, and I'm just watching it happen, and then I had to shut down their store because she was going to go out, and she was playing, right? So mm-hmm. I, you know, never went there again for anything. <laughs> and you're never going to tell anybody to go there. And you can see Sammy here has said, like, she she cuts hers but makes it a very positive experience and lots of fun and lots of treats. And that's the way you have to do it. And that's the right mindset because I would rather go and do it myself because I've had a similar experience with that um, with that exact place where I used to send um, I used to send Holly to be groomed. And I would say to them, don't make her stand. She has bad back legs. And they had the window where you can kind of see through. And Holly had kind of told me from the last time she was there that, like, I'm not liking this place. I'm not liking it at all. And <clears throat> I stayed around and I spied on them. And, oh, my God, they, did, they didn't listen to me. 
pretended they were going to do what I asked them to do, but didn't. And that's the last time I've gone there. And I actually then was grooming myself until I found out another great dog groomer because I was like, there is no way I'd rather do it myself. And she might not be looking the best, but I'm not stressing her out. It's not a bad experience and it's lots of treats. So I would prefer to do it myself than to be sending them to a so-called professional. But that's the thing, right? So like the audience, like honestly, share it with us, share your experiences or like, you know, get, give our viewers for sure good places where you can take your dogs for um, a really um, good experience. I mean, you know, grooming doesn't have to be negative, but unfortunately, this place has made butchered it for this individual and for their doggy too. Mm -hmm. uh, moving on to happier things. Um, <laughs> him. I never imagined we talk about George Clooney on the show, but Tim, tell us more about George and his dog Einstein. Or do you want me to tell you more about George or his dog? <laughs> I would like George for sure and his dog too. <laughs> yeah, no, George Clooney does not go out of style, but this one definitely, <clears throat> definitely caught my attention this week. So George Clooney did an interview with, with Vogue and I just happened to pick up a piece that, um, they wrote for the Irish Times. So it comes from somebody who's not a total dog lover, but it's all about how Clooney used his dog Einstein by writing letters from Einstein to Wu Amal. And it's like, oh my God, this is just great. Because you you write anything from my dog to me and I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. Like it's totally the, the way to go. So the opinion that um, this lady had was that she was like, always in love with George and no matter what like George was her Springste Springsteen clause and if anybody doesn't know what that means that means it's like you have your one celebrity if you ever met them and you're married or you have a, in a commi committed relationship that you can go off with them for the night so that was always her kind of go-to guy so she was a bit upset when she seen that George was writing letters to Amal getting him getting using Einstein so what, what he was doing was writing a letter and saying, Einstein is, has me locked up in the room. I can't get out. Come come save me. And was writing all these kind of lovely letters like from Einstein to Amal saying he needed a lawyer and he needed to get out of the room. So he was writing all these little letters to her all the time, just pretending he needed legal advice, which I was just like, I just love it. Like I love when I see people writing in their, in their, their dog spies, but the lady herself now um, <coughs> who wrote this article, <coughs> sorry guys, she was like, no, like she's like, this is like a bad taxi driver. She was having none of it. She's like, I do not like dogs just enough that I want to be on the receiving end of greeting cards or by humans pretending to be one. Like, I don't know, Suzanne, have you ever got um, a card or anything from your dogs? Well, not really because David doesn't really uh, <laughs> Sweet that way, but you know what? I got a greeting card from you and Holly actually. <laughs> that's for the Toronto dog walking event. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, no, I, I, but I, I love that. I, I love the story, and I love that you know it happened that way. I would totally be like, yes, yes. And yeah, I, I love it. Like, yeah. I've always signed off on cards for years for me and Holly. Like, I write cards to my mom on Mother's Day from her dogs. Like, I, I, like, I'm more comfortable writing from my dog than I am from myself. So, she also goes on in her story to say that, like, it's getting even worse that people are using Instagram accounts. That, like, it's now a thing if your dog doesn't have an Instagram account that, like, it's kind of the end of the world. And she's like... Like, yeah. like that. I love the dogs on Instagram. Like, I love talking to all the dogs on Instagram. So, guys, if anybody has any, any of you are watching that and your dog has an Instagram account, go ahead and um, share that handle. Definitely love to be love to be following them on Instagram. Sure. She goes. She goes on to say in her article about that. Actually, when she did started following these dogs for a long time now, that. It actually had the opposite effect that she actually loved seeing the dogs on their adventure. She loved going online to her Instagram and that she was having more interact with the dogs on Instagram than she was with her own friends. And she was actually shocked because she isn't a dog lover. She has no interest in writing to somebody in the dog's tone. So 
she's come around to the to the the bright side as i would say from the dark side and she's all about these dogs and and talking to dogs on instagram but you know yourself you how many how many friends are yours are on instagram or dogs you know what? Um, I have friends that have dogs on their Instagram. I have friends that have their cats on the Instagram too. They're like accounts for cats as well. So we live in such a digital era right now that this is like a common thing, right? And honestly, to tell you the truth, I follow. I have a lot of followers on Instagram, and I follow a lot of dog accounts as well. So I'm like, if you're a dog, I'm totally following you. <laughs> Yeah. Anybody out there? Do you does your dog have an Instagram account? How many dogs do you follow on Instagram? But I'm assuming if you're watching this show or listening, you're watching the show because you are one of those type of people. You probably do have your own dog's Instagram account. And I can't think of anything better because I'm not one for putting my life out there. But my life for Holly, um, yeah, my life when I'm out walking the dogs around Toronto, absolutely. Like people love upy fresh. Like it's never bad news. Like. You're never upset when you see a puppy come on your screen or like a video of a dog out and about they're shopping, they're with their mom, like it's good news. Like there's enough there's enough dark news going on in the world that we don't need to be seeing anything extra. So like I, I think the dogs brighten up our feeds and I I can't see any negativity, like even this lady who's like admit to herself that she's not a dog lover, that she has come around and seen the good side. So Yeah. I'm all for it. So guys, anybody out there got an Instagram account, pop in your handle. Um, we're going to come back and we're going to follow you guys. We want to see what you and your dog will get up to when you're when you're out exploring across the city of Toronto. Susanna, do your dogs actually have um, an Instagram account or are you just leading the way for them? You know what? I, I They don't have separate accounts. Um, they take over my account all the time like every other dog. I feel mm-hmm. like that's why I have so many followers. It's not me, it's the dogs. So I'm just going to keep it that way. <laughs> yeah, and that's what, um, guys, if you have actually got a dog, if you want to go on to um, our Instagram page, at Toronto Dog Walk, and we, we have Dawson taken over our Instagram account, and we do takeovers most Sundays, where we have a dog takeover, and we get to follow them on their Sunday fun day, which is just amazing. Like, I love getting to follow them, and then... They're getting like to everybody, like just showing off to the world what they're what they're up to. Like I, we had dogs that were going off to wineries, like going off on day trips and exploring up north. So today, Dawson is having his his um, birthday, his first birthday. So he is taking us along. He's going to be live streaming from our page. And even if you're watching this on the replay, it's going to be kept as a feature on our Instagram page. So you can go ahead and go to at Toronto Dog Walking and you'll be able to follow Dawson along on his birthday because it's going to be so much fun. Can't wait to see all his uh, birthday shenanigans what he gets into today. Fantastic. You know, like, having, a, having a birthday party for your dog, like, that is so me. Like, I would have, like, celebrate your dog. Like, give me any reason to celebrate my dog. And I'm like, yeah. Yeah, like you know, what? Not much. <laughs> I agree. Um, I celebrate when we lived in Queen West because all their friends are in Queen West. Like we had like for Bella's birthday, <laughs> his birthday, we had like cupcakes for humans, cupcakes for doggies, birthday little gifts, and they were just mm-hmm. running around. It was so cute. I would totally do it again all the time. <laughs> yeah, and like, do you ever get like when you're in those kinds of situations where nobody knows the human's name? It's all that's that's Bella's mom, that's Holly's yeah. mom, like. Nobody knows the names, but like you, you be like closer to, to them than like some of your acquaintances, like or friends that you not friends, friends, but like you know people who you just meet every now and then. It's just I don't know what it is about dogs and people. You, I just think somebody's a better person as well if they have a dog, and you can you've got this straight away like the the interest that they have, and you can talk about your dog, and they talk about their dog. And, like you meet me on the street, oh my god. I will, I'm going to talk about your dog. I'm going to tell you about my dog. <laughs> it goes on and on. But that's how, how we even know each other is from talking about our dogs. I know. We should, we should come with a warning. Hey, caution. This person may talk about a dog at any point. We're like, yeah, that, that's me for sure. <laughs> but it, it's a community, right? Like, and, and, yeah. you know, when my girlfriend adopted her dog, she, she wasn't, uh, it took her a little bit to understand 
hey, this is a dog. It's going to be a huge community because she was, you know, she loves dogs, but she didn't mm-hmm. realize how much more she would love that dog. Right? And it was a whole community. Like she has a whole new community of friends. So it's like a mm-hmm. dog friends, dogs for other friends that don't belong to the dog community. It's, it's like, it's a whole thing, right? Yeah. That's what like a lot of people, like even in my neighborhood, if you're out at certain times of day, you just get to know the people because they're doing the same. They're bringing their dog in for their potty before work, they're bringing them out after work, and it's great. Like, like I always bring up the example of Ruth. It's one of the dogs that we walk. I mean, everybody knows that dog in the neighborhood. I you walk along and they're like, "Oh, this Ruth is Ruth is Ruth is Ruth is Ruth." I even said to their like to the owners, I was like, "Oh my God!" Like everybody knows him, and she goes like. We've been living in this neighborhood for 10 plus years and we knew nobody, absolutely nobody. They knew nobody in the neighborhood. And ever since they got the dog and he's just over one, they know everybody. Like, it's insane. So it definitely builds up a community, just having dogs and meeting people that like are like-minded. But there is no downside to having a dog. It just brings extra greatness to your life. It does, it totally does. And like, you can definitely see when you're walking down the street, people smile. Mm. They're not smiling at you, they're smiling at your dogs. Yeah, yeah. They're but like, dogs. they wouldn't even look your way if you haven't got the dog. I do love people, you're walking along, they're like, hi, yeah, hi, yeah. But they're not saying hello exactly, like, they're not talking to me, they're like, they're talking to Holly, like, you get in the elevator, and they're like, oh, I love your boots or whatever, but like, they're talking to the dog. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. These are all yeah. my kind of people. Yeah, that's the thing, though, and this is why, like, I don't just have one dog, I have like three of them now, and you know. Mm-hmm. This is why I'm not allowed to go on vacations anymore to pick up another dog. Exactly. Right, we best move on and keep to work because we can talk about that all day long. So, Understood. <laughs> another awesome article from Science Daily. They are amazing for providing great studies on them, um, literally all things stuff. So, you're going to go through when dogs are more expressive. So, I'm assuming like this might be like in certain situations, but I want you to tell us what you know. I'm just a very rude-faced person, so like, and, and my hope, and your hope as well for everybody watching the show, is just to get us closer to our dogs and closer to their dogs and just have a better bond, a better relationship, right? So the more research that we read and share, the better we are going to be parents to our dogs, right? Or our pets, right? Um, so yes, this article is from the Science Daily. So dogs produce more facial expressions when humans are looking at them. And this is according to uh, a research that is done at the University of Portsmouth. So did you know, did you know this? Like, did, the, did you know anything about this topic before or like? That's what I've like, um, like the studies that they brought up before, I would have like had a good kind of knowledge behind it and kind of situations, but not in, not in this case. Okay. I just like to touch, touch base right before we start uh, getting into the article. Um, to all our viewers, if you have kind of read this topic already, or, or did you assume this was happening or not, just share with us. Um, I would love to know. So scientists at University uh, Dog Cognition Center are the first to clear evidence dogs move their faces in direction response to human attention, which is awesome. I love this. Dogs uh, don't respond with more facial expression about seeing tasty food. Uh, so that this suggests that dogs produce facial expressions to communicate and not just because they are excited, which is great evidence, right? Mm-hmm. So um, any kind of facial expression such as brow raising, which makes uh, the eyes look bigger, so-called puppy dog eyes, was a dog's most commonly used expression in <laughs> this research. Just again. Yeah, like, like come on, those puppy dog eyes, they get them whenever they want, when they, when they, when they got, like. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, this is David's excuse all the time. But look at them, and I'm like, David, they're older, they're not puppies. <laughs> but look at their eyes, and I'm like, I get it. So Dr. Julianne Kaminsky, she, she, she was the one to lead the study, and I'm mm-hmm. going to read a quote for the article. We can now be confident that the production of facial expressions made by dogs are dependent on the attention state of their audience and not just a result of dogs being excited. In our study, they produced far more expressions when someone was watching, but seeing food treats did not have the same effect, which is amazing, right? Yeah. Even for dog training purposes too, right? You know, that attention that they get from humans is also very valuable. 
Yeah, because people totally underestimate that part. Yes. They just take the tree and like the value of the tree, not the value of the person and what the person is actually doing when they're getting what they want. Absolutely. So this also just straightens straightens our responses with our dogs too. So mm -hmm. it is well known that most mammals produce facial expressions. Such expressions are considered an important part of an animal's behavior repertoire. But it has long been assumed that animal facial expressions, including some human facial expressions, are involuntary and dependent on individual's emotional state rather than uh, being flexible responses to the audience. So Dr. Kaminsky also said that dog facial expressions might be due to produce the process of being domesticated, which, you know what, they've been around for 30,000 years, so for sure, yeah, I totally um, agree with that. So how was this research conducted? So there were 24 dogs, all sorts of different breeds, so all breeds were welcome, and ages were between 1 to 12. They were all family uh, pets. So the way this experiment was conducted was that each dog was tied by a lead a meter away from their person and the dog's faces were filmed throughout a range of exchanges. So from the person being oriented towards the dog to being distracted and with her body or his body turned away from the dog, which was a really cool experiment, mind you. I, I would love to find if there's any videos about this so we can yeah, really share it. Just to watch it and see like like it's great to like that you're explaining it all to us, but it'd be great if we could actually see like the little difference in their expressions as as they we're in the different positions. It's super interesting. Oh, for sure. And so the question when I was reading this article was like, what was the measure? What, what did they use to measure dog spatial expression? So the dog spatial expression is were measured using dog facts, which was the anatom anatomically based coding system, which gives a reliable and standardized measures of facial changes linked to underlying muscle movements. So the, the cool thing about this is, this was made for humans, right? But they were mo they modified it to dogs. So the co-author and facial expression expert, Professor Bridget Waller, said that dog backs captures movements from all the different muscles in the canine face, many which are capable of producing very subtle and brief facial movements. I this is a really cool thing. Like I would really, I'm going to actually make some more things about this just to. If I can track it or maybe email the university professors about this, mm -hmm. just so I can know that um, if they have any videos or anything they would be willing to share, that would be amazing. Yeah, uh, um, the dog breed as well would make a huge difference because if you have a lab, their facial expressions are easy, whereas if you have a Shih Tzu, it's a lot harder to see their facial expressions. So, like, it's always the tiniest thing, and you would even see it as like a dog trainer when you're out, like, you can tell when a dog is totally di like thinking differently or motivated where it's always just pointing out those small little signals yes. to their owner like look they're engaged with you they're like they're listening that kind of stuff so yes. we would definitely th like that would be awesome if you could reach out to them and just see if they can give us some more more information and maybe some images or some clips that would be so good i would love to and you know what i'm going to actually do that just because i'm, I'm more interested in know about this and you're right I can definitely see it on, on Katie. Katie has such an expressive face, so she mm -hmm. will let you know if she's engaged with you or not engaged with you, right? Like that social engagement, that's super important. Bella, Bella, you can see it on her. She's a half bulldog and half a shih tzu. If mm -hmm. she's got long hair, I don't see anything. <laughs> her facial expressions are, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> completely minimized. Um, so Dr. Kaminsky also went on and said that domestic do dogs have a unique history because they have lived with alongside humans for about 30,000 years. And during that time, selection pressures seem to have acted on dogs' ability to communicate with us. Um, so there is a previous studies that have done. We, we, we've we known that domesticated dogs paid attention to how attentive a human is in a previous study. But, for example, the dogs, um, when they stole food to more often when the human eyes were closed or if they uh, turned their backs around, right? So this is also telling you that they've been in tune with us as well. Additional study was found that dogs uh, follow the gaze of a human if the human first establishes eye contact with the dog, so the dog knows the gaze shift is directed at them. Um, in addition to um, that, the findings of this paper or the, um, their support evidence that dogs are sensitive to humans attention and expression uh, expressions are potentially active attempts to communicate and not simple just to show uh emotional displays so 
this is actually uh, a really cool study. And it's actually letting us know more about the dogs. And it's moving us forward with our understanding about dog cognition. So we know, um, we know the dogs make more facial expressions, but humans are paying attention. Um, so I kind of just wanted to share that the, the journal reference from this article. So it's, it's by Julianne Kaminsky and Jennifer Pins, Paul Morris, and Bridget M. Waller. It's called Human Attention Affects Facial Expressions in Domestic Dogs. We'll share this too within uh, this episode as well at the end. Uh, so I just kind of want to ask your thoughts, Sam, and the thoughts of our audience as well on this article. Yeah, I'd love to hear um, the thoughts of everybody out there. Like, I, I'm pretty like, yeah, I want, I want to know, I want to know what my dog's thinking, especially with her being a Shih Tzu. Like, her, it's like even like when you're just coming to whole body language of dogs, like her signs are a lot more subtle than Katie's would be. And I, I just love to know if anybody out there who has a dog, like, like I know some dogs who are super expressive, but is your dog expressive? And if they are, if you happen to catch a picture of them when they're when they're super expressive, I love that kind of stuff. So you guys, if you post them in the comments, even if you're not watching live, we will be coming back and checking in. So we'd love to see your dog being expressive. But I definitely would just so love to see more about the study. It's it's so interesting. Like even if, even if it was just a human study, like like to see like it's so much easier to see when somebody's not impressed with you or they're happy with you it's easier to read a human but so would love 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 to see more of this so what where what country was that study done in was it in europe i feel like it was but you know what no i think it's yeah i think it's in europe yeah all the good stuff like from um the guys who are doing studies just seems to be a lot of research um gets done in europe more than we see anything that's actually directly coming from the US or, or Canada. Like it just seems to be, because we do a lot of science daily articles because who doesn't love their science when it comes to dog training and all this kind of stuff. So we'll, we'll hook it up in the show notes anyway afterwards. Yeah, you know what? I'm just actually just looking at it. Um, I, feel like, I feel like it's Europe. It doesn't say anything in the article here. Uh, but you know what, you're right, every cool thing comes from Europe, like even every article thus far that I've done, it's like done in Switzerland, Sweden, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's we need to be cooler like that too, I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, especially if like it was closer to home and we'd be like, can we participate? <laughs> we would be so all on that, like, like I, I'm, I'm assuming these studies take a long time and I'd love to even see more, We, the, you know the study that we're talking about using the, the brain games for the dogs using the iPads and the cognitive approach, like I would love to just even, because I haven't seen anything breaking out in the news or anything about any interactive dog toys for, for brain games, because I love like the brain games and the enrichment games. So it'd be great to see, hopefully that comes out soon enough. Like I'm assuming it will be expensive, but there's brain games for your dogs is just, it's so, it's so enriching for them. Like, and it just helps with, with, with daily life because they're you're training their brain they know when good things happen and it just makes training for other tasks a lot easier so it, it, and, and definitely to add to that like we have like our lifestyles are really busy as is right and it's mm -hmm. not fair to our dogs right and we live in a country where winter takes literally 12 months i would say mm -hmm. and then we have like an invisible summer or whatever, right? <laughs> so because of that, I would say it's a good investment because you're paying the dogs to pay for it. They're not going to destroy your house, um, and you know they're going to be better, better trained. Mm -hmm. That is a perfect segue for our next topic. So, as last week we had the ice storm, but this week spring has arrived, so everybody is out and. I just want to talk about socializing your dogs. So I was out yesterday and we were out at the, the beach slash park. And with the good weather brings out people who have not probably walked their dog all winter, apart from probably walking them around the block where they are. So I came across so, so many reactive dogs. Dogs just losing their crap just from being in a different situation from what they're normally used to. And 
I know like a lot of people who are watching the show won't be those kind of people who only walk their dogs when the weather is nice. But the fact is there is so many people that just walk their dog when the weather is nice. I have met people outside my building and they have actually told me that, oh, I can't wait for the weather to get nice to be able to actually walk my dog. And I'm like, just because the weather's not nice, like I don't say it's enough, but I'm just like, because the weather's not nice doesn't mean you shouldn't be walking your dog. Like I can't even imagine if I didn't walk my dog. So what I'm just trying to get at here is just make a baby steps. If your dog hasn't been out all winter, don't be throwing them into situations where they aren't uncomfortable. Like start building it out, start making a positive experience. So I just want to talk about socializing your dog. So many issues, and Suzanne, I'm sure you agree, so many issues even from dogs when they're being reacted just comes from a lack of socialization from an early age. Mm -hmm. So socialization is just one of the most overlooked aspects of owning a dog. The majority of reasons that a dog considered is being bad or is being reactive is not his or her own fault, but typically the problem is how the dog was raised. Issues such as aggression, fear are almost always due to a lack of socialization with the dog because the dog might only be getting let out to the back garden and then you then you decide you want to bring your dog for a walk because it's a, it's a nice day and you're like, okay, I feel like going for a walk. But the dog, to the dog, it's very, very scary. They haven't been in this situation. You're bringing them out of somewhere that they've never been. And especially if you've not been walking them for a long periods of time or they've never seen certain neighborhoods, it's very, very scary for the dog. So what you want to be doing, you want to start, like when you, when you get your puppy, start your dog's socialization from early as possible. Even if you get a rescue dog or you haven't walked your dog all, all winter and you know you want to start walking your dog, you need to make these sessions nice, short and sweet. You want to be using positive reinforcement. Like even if, say, say if you have a puppy, you want to be getting your puppy introduced to other dogs at, as early as possible because you don't want them then going out and meeting dogs when they're six or seven months and they're like, oh my God, like, and they're reacting, they're barking at the dog. They're do and to you, you're just like, what's wrong? Like, and you're not understanding why the dog is freaking out because they see another dog. But to them, that dog, they don't, they don't even know they're a dog. So they're just like, they don't they associate, I'm a dog, this is another dog, and there shouldn't be anything wrong. A lot of the barking generally comes from hey, stay away from me. Maybe if I bark there, the dog's not going to come near me. So you'll see some dogs will act submissive and they'll lie down and they'll hope that the dog just goes on by. But the other dogs will just bark and simply because they just don't know what exactly is going on. So with socialization, it doesn't only come down to other dogs. It comes down to noises, people. So you want to be introducing them to all different kinds of people like men with beards, men with hats, women, children. You want to be exposing them to everything as early as possible. And we have actually created a great scavenger list. So if you type social into the comment section right now, we actually have a list built out so you can actually work through step by step how to gradually expose your dog to certain situations. So you'll be talking about elevators. You want to go on the subway. You want to introduce them to dogs. It's just getting your dog used to the big bad world because to them everything is new you can't just assume that okay my dog is okay on the subway so they're going to be okay on the streetcar you want to make sure that your dog is used to all different situations being on all different kinds of surfaces it's all just about exposure even if your puppy is like hasn't got their shots you can still carry them around you can bring them around socialize them to all different places Make everything positive experiences, lots of treats, lots of rewards, and keep the sessions short. If your dog is experiencing, like they're absolutely freaking out and they're not happy in the situation, don't force them. Keep everything short, sweet, and upbeat and positive. So lots and lots of new experiences. If you go ahead right now and if you type social into the comment section, then Spot or Dogbot will send you then a whole scavenger list that will help you get through. It doesn't matter if it's a puppy or it's an adult dog, same applies. The puppy will probably be a little bit easier because they haven't had any negative associations with it. Whereas if you have a rescue dog, you don't know what their past has been like. You don't know any of their experience or associations to certain situations. So that will go a long way in just building it out. And it's just a cheat sheet that's gonna help you and help your dog. So Suzanne, I don't know what like, 
would you have a lot of issues like dogs that come to you and the the issues would stem from um, a lack of socialization? Probably, probably. Oh, really? Yeah, for six months of his life, he hasn't really been exposed to a lot of things, right? So I had to expose him and socialize them with dogs, streetcars, queenless, MH, mm -hmm. cats, different sizes of purses, different um, um, shapes of purses, uh, and a lot of other dogs too. Like, you know, dogs freak out. We freak out as well, right? Um, if you haven't done something for a very long time, or if it's the first time you're presenting for the 700 people, please tell me you're not, you know, going to freak out over that, right? Yeah, people like that. go ahead. It's just that you said Kingsley was six months. Some people would think six months of age is early, but six months of age is you late. Are, you have to expose right away, right? The socialization has to happen right away because he missed this prime socialization within the first six months, right? So unfortunately, because of that, it took a good six months to expose him to a lot of other things too, right? But again, and I wanted to say, like, you have given, like, really lovely tips. Uh, but also, just remember, not every exposure is good exposure, right? So, like, make sure that you pair everything with a positive kind of thing, even those scary things. Because, again, even if they get scared, anxiety builds up, right? Stresses build up. Trigger stacking builds up too, right? And, again, how would dogs learn how to live in an environment unless we socialize them with, you know, our house, our apartment, our car, um, food, different dogs, different people outside, right? They can't leave their minds. Um, mm -hmm. And if they're not exposed to it appropriately and at an early age, they're not going to know how to react. They're not going to know how to say hi to dogs. They're not going to know how mm -hmm. to um, have limits when they're playing with dogs, right? Like, because dogs naturally teach other dogs, right? Mm -hmm. So unless we expose them, how is that going to happen? Yeah, it, it's, it's huge and it's people there is a huge underestimation and I always say to people yeah your dog doesn't have your shots like when they're when they're coming up like they're nine ten weeks of age I'm like you still need to get outside like just to have it set up that you know your dog's not going to be in certain areas like you can carry your dog you can go around wow. those stages are so critical in the you development like you got to start early and you can't you can't start quick enough doesn't matter if it's an adult dog and you're at the rescue and the dog started out but as that's what Susanna, if you can just give a quick kind of snippet of what a trigger is because how easily you can stack up and then we can end up in the situation that we we're talking about last week about dog bites if you just give them a quick just a quick like couple of sentences just about triggers because people won't understand what the trigger and the stacking actually means Okay, so triggers, think about uh, things that would make your dogs want to react, right? Or just kind of looking at their body language and they become stiff and then they seem more like if your dog is, um, let's say, scared of, I'm look, just looking outside right now, so I'm like looking at dogs playing, so I'm a little bit distracted too. <laughs> so if, if your dog, for example, is scared of other dogs and your dog is reacting um, at those dogs, that's a trigger, right? If your dog sees one dog and it's fine, that's fine. If your dog sees another dog from a distance, you know, distance and your dog doesn't react, that's another thing. But if your dog keeps seeing different dogs or, or different things that make them upset in, in during your walk, that's called trigger stacking, right? So like they might not react from the first trigger that they see, but the more triggers that they see, they start reacting. Yeah, that's absolutely it. So guys, don't keep forcing them out and out. They don't like a dog, they, they're they're mild, then it gets worse and gets progressively worse because they'll never actually come down to the relaxed state of mind before they see the first dog. So that's why when Susanna says, keep your, your sessions short and sweet, it's for a reason because your dog won't have the right mindset to be able to, to relax and to be able to continue. And you, you, it's going to just make your life harder and you're going to get more frustrated because your dog isn't the perception of seeing another dog has isn't changing in their mind because you're literally stacking it up and making it worse and worse and worse. So oh, absolutely. We, we definitely can go on and on talk more about that. But another thing that can also help for socialization is something you can do at home. And it's called Soundproof Puppy App. So this is great even for dogs who are adult dogs. So if your dog is afraid of fireworks, the garbage truck, the, the construction noises. This is actually an app that has all those sounds recorded. So you can start playing them out at a really low sound 
and say like be feeding your dog at the same time so they start building the positive association to that noise so that's also a great one for socializing because you can't just wait till Canada Day and the fireworks are going off and your dog is going crazy so there's so much that you can do in advance just to make your pup a well-adjusted pup it's called soundproof puppy app and we'll pop that in the show notes it's it's an amazing app and you can go follow them on Facebook, see how it works. They even have a great part of the app where it mimics grooming and plays the sound of a clippers and the phone vibrates at the same time. So you're getting your dog used to the whole situation of grooming and, oh, that's another place that you should always go with your dog, the vets, the groomers, when you don't have appointments and make it all positive associations. So Susanna, is there anything else that you want to cover off on them um, socializing your pup before we move on? Start with least to most. I would say start with like um, an exposure to everything and just have in mind that not every exposure is a good exposure. Watch your dog's body language because you know what, even if you're too squeaky or too loud or other people around, just don't assume your dog is fine because you want your dog to be fine, right? Because mm -hmm. like in the long run, you're going to have to be comfortable conditioning and using exposure, which we're going to be talking about next. But uh, mm -hmm. I'm just saying like, watch your dog's body language and expose them, pair it with a tree, pair it with a positive experience, because you know what? You want to have a dog that's okay with the environment. Mm -hmm. And yeah, then no. socialize. Totally, totally. Like, and that's what, guys, we want to go ahead and type social into the comment section. You'll be able to get a great cheat sheet and help you and your dog go explore the, the world and what it has to offer and make them the most confident pup. It's all about setting your dog up for success. So setting your dog up for success. I was out walking a dog the other day and he's reactive. He's not super, super reactive, but he is reactive. And I was walking along Lakeshore. And so I would give the signal that, okay, I need to hold this dog because he's super loose leash walker. So I would give the, like, the signal that I have to hold this leash and keep him to my side. And I was approaching this lady and her German Shepherd puppy. I think he's about 10 months old. And he's like, she said to me, oh, he's super friendly. And I was like, oh, this one isn't. And she actually said to me, that's totally fine. I get it. And I was like, mind blown, blown. Like, mind was blown. Because, guys, if you have a reactive dog or know someone who has a reactive dog, this is what makes their life so hard is that people do not understand that I have a reactive dog. I give them space. So I literally, I went on Facebook Live straight away afterwards. And I was cheering this woman on. I was like, she gets it. I don't come across many people. Like, I can't even remember the last time I came across somebody who actually gets it. So that's why I am so excited to have our guest on today. We have Bianca from Positive Pecker. And Bianca is a dog walker. And she actually specializes in walking reactive dogs. So when I had this situation come up this week, I was like, Susanna, who do we know who can talk about this? And she's like, I have a great friend, Bianca. So, Bianca, I'm so excited to have you on the show today. Welcome. Hi, Pam. Hi, Susanna. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, we're just so, we're so happy to have you here. That's what, when, I'm sure you yourself, you don't come across many people when you're out walking reactive dogs who actually understand that that dog needs space. Almost never. Uh, and a lot of people kind of take it personally sometimes when you say, you know what, no, I need some space uh, just for everybody's safety. Uh, they act as if they've done something wrong or you're not managing it properly because mm -hmm. they can't say hi to a dog they want to say hi to. So it can be frustrating. <laughs> yeah, and that's what we, we, we were even saying last week. We had um, dangerous dogs and we're going through the dangerous dogs in Toronto. And that's a huge one is that some people might get slightly embarrassed because they're saying their dog can't say hello because they're worried about the other person and their perception of like what you just said, like, oh, I'm like, I don't know what to do here because like, I want to say hi and you're telling me I can't and they don't mm -hmm. get it, which is like the biggest problem of it all. And just for those who are joining us, if you have a reactive dog, go ahead and let us know because having a reactive dog is a lot harder those guys have to work with their dog day in day out and i just bianca if you can just tell people what a reactive dog is so because some people watching might just have a dog who's nice and placid 
and would have never experienced having a reactive dog, so don't understand it. It's a it's a big question to ask. A reactive dog can be a dog really that reacts in a situation uh, where people wouldn't necessarily expect them to react. Um, and a reactive dog can even be a very happy dog that has a very overexcited and positive reaction when they see something that is what Susanna defined earlier as a trigger to them. But then a lot of the time you get a reactive dog that is unfortunately uh, exhibiting signs that we would, as people would consider threatening. So it is really easy for uh, people to kind of misunderstand a dog that's, you know, reacting negatively to something in the moment as a bad dog or a dog that uh, doesn't get the kind of same love and care that it needs to be a normal and stabilized dog. And that's, I think, something that people uh, should maybe, I, I guess I wish people knew that difference a little bit more, I guess I should say. Yeah. Um, what would you consider is the biggest trigger for a reactive dog that seems to be kind of up there? Like what would it be? Like the skateboards, people, <laughs> like strangers. What would you consider when you're walking reactive dogs seems to be one of the like the top? <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, oh my God, it can be anything. Um, a lot of the time it's people. Um, people who are really excited to see uh, a dog that they're happy about. Um, so people can be a big one. Dogs are very often a big one um, because if you're walking a reactive dog and you run into an owner with another dog, uh, they're usually like, oh, it's okay, it's fine, my dog is great. And then maybe if you express that you need some space, uh, they, they insist. So that can, that can be a big trigger for sure um, if you get an un unwanted approach. <laughs> um, and then there are other really small variables that people probably would almost never consider unless you've had to deal with it. Um, a big one can be wind. Uh, wind is a huge trigger for a dog that I uh, that I take care of. Um, snow plows, the the weather, <laughs> like it it could you know it really comes down to like sometimes whether the sun is shining or not. Like it can be anything. <laughs> yeah, and people need to understand that. Like it's not that that dog is aggressive or it just could be the smallest little thing that the dog just is not comfortable with and. Mm -hmm. The biggest piece that we would like to cover is just education. Because when we came to see that there was 700 dog bites last year in Toronto, like we had 150 dangerous dogs, I think just education on the people who not even have the dog, but just to the people that are walking down the street that have a no like what would be considered a normal dog. But yes. what, what do you think the tips are that we could use just to help educate the people and just being proactive because it's all about education when it comes down to these dangerous dogs and no what no what I'm saying dangerous dogs if anybody caught last week's show it, yes exactly it's, it's the, the dangerous dogs and it's, it's, a lot of it I'm, I'm assuming comes from putting dogs in bad situations and not listening to the dog and not being standing up for your dog and getting embarrassed because you don't want to tell somebody not to come near your dog and you're like, oh, I'm going to try. And you're, you're crossing your fingers that the dog's going to have a positive like reaction towards the other dog and it won't. So it's always just something small. So we hope that you can shed some light and hopefully educate everybody out there and to just get these numbers down and dog bites and all this kind of stuff. So you are the person working with reactive dogs day in, day out. So what do you think that people need to hear? I think that um, for anybody who really likes dogs, even if you don't have one, it's really worth just Googling uh, canine body language to kind of educate yourselves on the really small different ways that you can recognize if a dog might want to say hi to you on the street or if it doesn't. Um, there's a really great app. Um, Susanna, I think you reposted it on your Instagram once and I found this amazing Instagram and app. It's called Dog Decoder. And it prevents, the, or excuse me, it presents these really beautiful, clear, simple graphics that explain for regular people um, like kind of the things to look for if a dog is really stressed out or if it's really happy. Um, some people, you know, may not easily recognize if a dog's body language becomes very tense or if they're kind of looking around or very distracted or very, you know, that nervous body language that people don't know how to identify. It's just really small Google searches that can show you things like this that will really help you be able to identify um, 
kind of, you know, just dogs in your environment. And it's, it's good for you to be interacting with them. Yeah, that sounds really good. So what's the app called? It's called Dog Decoder. Um, I believe it costs about five fifty to download and have, but they have a great Instagram app that has a lot of the same info for free. Oh, that, that sounds great. And is it like cartoon based or are they um, mm -hmm. cartoon based images? Yeah, because that's what they're, there is so much out there. And like five fifty, what's five fifty if you're going to get education? Five fifty like, or a dog bite. Yeah, <laughs> and then if you want to go and get professional help, you're like you'd be like maybe five hundred fifty. Like it's not going to be five dollar fifty to get the download, but exactly. that, is, that is that is such a great app that we're going to add that into the show notes. I wasn't um, I wasn't aware. I've seen some great images. That's what you're saying. Like there is the free resources. I've seen people post similar images on Facebook, like mm -hmm. kind of showing like the lip lifting and just how the bodies. The dog's body language would be would be um, different, and it's just the smallest little thing that, like, if you just learn and pick up on your dog's body language, huge, huge, huge. Like it changes everything. Yeah, and you, but with you out walking dogs every day, and especially reactive, I can't even imagine the peace of mind you provide the owners with, because you know what you're doing. You know what the dog is saying to you without the dog having to say it. Yeah. It's definitely yeah, a really special connection. I'm so blessed to have a lot of dogs in my life, um, especially now, because I grew up with what I know now to be a reactive dog and didn't handle it properly as a kid. So to be able to kind of have lived both sides and now you know what, I did some things as a kid with my shit skills that didn't work. And mm -hmm. now I'm working with, you know, the kinds of dogs that I usually work with, like pit bulls, Dobermans, shepherds, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, it's just nice to kind of be able to you know, the things that can be, that you would never even think of in terms of, oh, I'm picking my dog up when it doesn't want to be picked up or it's growling at me, but I still need to handle it somehow. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's it's nice to have lived both sides. Yeah, that's a huge point that you just said there is listening to the dog. So if it is growling, and I see, I've seen the, these crazy videos on on Facebook, where a child would be hugging a dog, and it's just lucky that they didn't capture like that could what could be a fatality on camera. Like yes, and that's one thing that I find. I have a hard time with recently in the rise of how you were talking about amazing dogs on Instagram and Facebook and things like that. Um, it's so good for people like us because we get to make those connections, but mm -hmm. owners who are kind of just getting into that without really having any insight into body language or socialization or anything like that, you see a lot of things that are kind of what people would say are for the gram that make a really funny video or really funny photo that in fact, are kind of going to have lasting repercussions that the owner would never even think about. Um, so, yeah, I see that a lot with, like, babies hugging dogs and mm -hmm. dogs, like, you know, like, running up on another dog and surprising it or a dog standing there and barking at another dog for no reason. You know what I mean? Like, there's just really small things that owners will find will come back to bite them in the butt later. That is actually <laughs> huge. Like, I see it all the time and on Instagram, putting their dog in a pose putting clothes on them put, and their dog is clearly on them. <laughs> like I was watching this um, little shih tzu on they had done a live and they had put the dog on like a little ottoman and the dog was stressed out of its mind Aww. and everybody was like this is so cute blah blah and I'm like hello like it's down to the smallest thing that that's what you're exactly it posing your dog for Instagram if it's fun for them and they like it but a lot of people aren't reading those small little signs that it's not fun for your dog. They're putting sunglasses on the dog, putting like crazy boots, like all this kind of if your dog doesn't mind it. But you can see by the dog's body language. And I do like look sometimes and I'm like, everybody's saying how cute and funny it is. But the dog is clearly saying, I'm not liking this. And then you become the villain when you point out that, oh, this dog looks really stressed or, you know, you know, that doesn't really look like a very fun situation for that dog. And it's like, oh, but it's cute. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, you see it all the time on all the viral posts, even on Facebook, like when they do about dogs. And there is the people that just because they know so much about body language and about dogs, they're saying this dog is stressed. This dog like they can see it because it's like 
It's like to us seeing a, a baby scream and crying. Nobody's going to say a baby is screaming and crying is cute. But we can see that the dog is literally crying from the inside, that this is not what they want to be doing. Yet everybody's, oh, my God, this is so cute. They're telling their friends, oh, I wish, like, like, like Molly could do this or that kind of stuff. And mm-hmm. huge, though. Like, just that you said it now that, like, I'm like, I see it all the time. So just, just really simple little- things like that really put a par- barrier, I find, between, you know, people and understanding dog's body language and you know, how they can avoid situations where they could get hurt. <laughs> yeah, because it's just the lack of education because I'm assuming these dog owners don't realize that their dog is actually telling them, listen, I'm a bit uncomfortable with what you're doing. Like, please don't do it. But you can always make it fun and rewarding. Like, if you want them to wear clothes, you want to just make it fun. Like, positive associations with them. Like, so much can be done, but that's a great point. Like, <laughs> a lot of people would miss those signs so much. Exactly, and it's 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 hard for regular people to know anything about dog, bo- excuse me, dog body language without having a reason to know. So I think that it's a, so good, you know, body language and reactive dogs because it really does lead to bite prevention. Mm-hmm. It definitely does. What other tips would you would you think that people would need to know about walking walking a reactive dog or just being the the person on the street when somebody else is walking a reactive dog? If you're the person on the street, honestly, if it's a reactive dog or not, always ask. Always ask if you can approach. And again, approach an approach and a greeting are can kind of be broken down into two different things. Always ask if you can approach first, but then don't touch the dog right away. Ask if you can approach. If the owner says yes, that's great. Approach, and if the dog seems interested in you, then you can touch it and you can say hi and you can pet it and that's a great experience for you. But if you approach and even if the owner says yes, you notice that the dog really isn't kind of into you at all, don't, don't, don't force it. Even if the owner says yes, you know, just, just, you know, you've said hi and, you know, let the dog go, go on its way without you becoming the big scary person for that dog. Um, If you ask somebody to pet a dog and the owner says no, or you see a dog that you want to, you want to pet and you kind of notice that the handler, the owner is avoiding people, avoiding dogs, kind of avoiding busy places, like, don't even bother. Don't don't even bother. Um, but if they say no, just respect that because it's probably for your safety. <laughs> it's probably yeah. gonna be in your best interest. Um, but if you, uh, go, go ahead, ahead, sir. I just know it's just with your story there that like just so got it. Like we would cross the street a lot when we're we're walking a reactive dog. But literally, my friend was walking a reactive dog, so she's seen a dog coming towards her. So mm-hmm. she's like, "Okay, I'm gonna cross the street." So what happens? The dog, cro- the other owner, and the dog cross the street to to be on the same side. So then she crosses the street again because she's like, seriously, like I'm trying to hide from you, and she follows again. So this happens four times, and she literally had to say, "I am trying to get away from you. My dog is aggressive. Like she just pops that out there just because to keep them away." But she was like, "Oh, but my dog just wants to say hi." I'm like, sometimes the common sense just isn't there. Like I'm like. Clearly, like if somebody wanted to say hello, like there's nobody else on the street. Like it's one of those pri- like quiet neighborhoods where across the street it's very obvious that like you're trying to avoid somebody. So that's exactly just what you're saying. That just when you were saying that, like what to do when you're the other person is li- like common sense. A little bit of common sense goes a long way. Exactly, and if you don't understand why that person maybe keeps crossing the street to get away from you use your voice ask say hey can my dog say hi to your dog my dog is so excited to say hello you know what i mean it's it's really the best tool that you can use if you're walking a reactive dog or you're around a dog that you don't know is is use your voice before a situation you know presents itself face to face where something could could have the potential to go really wrong it's always best to kind of establish that boundary before you get right up to it um i love though <laughs> I love that your friend always is the one kind of always avoiding because I, I definitely know that life. Um, I, I was very shy um, back in the day and well, still I'm a little bit, but I definitely had to learn how to, how to speak up and use my voice, especially when some people don't necessarily understand a dog's reactive body language. I used to walk uh, a Doberman that show one of his big signs of stress was um, stopping to rub his head up against me. And if people 
were around me, they assumed that he wanted it. That was he was doing that because he wanted attention and he wanted to be pet. So people wouldn't even ask; they just reach out and touch him. Um, so it it made things very clear to me very quickly that I had to start, you know, being, you know, upfront and using my voice and not putting the dog into a situation where he suddenly might react and hurt that person. So it was a, a huge learning curve. Always is such a big learning curve when you're presented with a reactive dog. Yeah, that's why, like, the, just the permission, asking for permission. And with that sign, like, unless you knew that dog, you wouldn't necessarily know that that was a sign of, like, I need, like, I need you here to be the boundary between me and whatever the trigger is. So having you, like, just walk somebody's dog who, like, knows that stuff, like, I can't imagine the owner, like, the peace of mind. The relaxing, like known. She's going to speak up for my dog. She's going to make sure that my dog doesn't get in a in the in a situation that he doesn't need to be. And that's the thing. If you were shy, I'm a shy person. I'm not even somebody who likes to be on camera, like I'm like right now. But for the dogs, I will speak up. For me, I could I like somebody could literally hit me, and I'd be just. I might not say anything. But Same here. For the dogs, yeah, for the dogs, I nearly got in a fight the other day because I was walking a dog. And some woman, like, we just had the ice storm, the half of the, the sidewalk was closed off. And I'm walking a dog who doesn't like to walk. And he was kind of trailing behind and she's like, oh, my God, the dog. And I'm like, there, there's no room here on the sidewalk. And I'm just like, those little people that, like, that, I'm just like, okay, okay, I just need to, like, relax here. Because I, I will speak up for the dogs. That dog was doing his best that day. And I'm sure <laughs> that you feel like you're the cheerleader for those dogs when you're out walking them. It's, it's, it can definitely be really tricky, especially because a lot of people, that person who said that to you, you know, they may not have had the dog, but they probably love dogs. And it's those really small things where, you know, people who have dogs and people who love dogs don't, you know, aren't necessarily willing to tolerate the small things that come along with having dogs in our lives. Like, you know, it's an ice storm and sometimes it's really hard for them to walk. And, you know, if you're walking a reactive dog, post ice storm where the sidewalks are closed off, you're going to need extra space and things are going to be slow. And like you said earlier for the owners, um, in terms of having that peace of mind, you know, with a handler who knows how to walk reactive dogs, it's so big for them because, you know, as, as much as I love to handle reactive dogs, you know, I don't, I don't own a dog myself and I give those reactive dogs back to their owners at the end of the day. And they're the one that has to handle them all the time and are basically night and day confronted with the situations that we're talking about now that are kind of, you know, so, you know, a, a situational thing for us. They don't happen all the time. Um, so for, you know, for those people, you know, to, to be able to pass, you know, it's, it's just, it's just good to be able to have somebody that can, that can understand and speak up for reactive dogs for sure. Yeah. People don't know the life of owning a reactive dog. These people might be a walk in their dog before everybody gets out with their dogs in the morning. They're the last thing in life. They're trying to do their best. So if you're out with them during the day, let them be like, what, what would you like, like if you were to give somebody the last bit of advice as a reactive dog owner or as the person on the street, what would you tell them? As an owner, uh, I would, my biggest piece of advice is to say that the walk starts before the walk. you got to evaluate so many different things, how you're feeling, how your dog's feeling, what the weather's like outside, so many different things before the walk starts and make sure that you're fully prepared. Um, and then once you're outside, you know, always keep, just like you guys were talking about earlier, keep it short and sweet, especially if your dog has a lot of triggers. And if you're that person on the street, um, just use your best discretion, you know, educate yourself on dog body language if you really like dogs, and then you'll be able to, you know, have a better awareness of uh, if you want to say hi to a dog and they're not really into it, you won't be able to take it personally. Yeah, awesome advice. Susanna, have you any questions for Bianca before she leaves us? Um, how would people find out more about you? Because like you have such valuable information to share. I mean, I know how to find you. <laughs> how would others find you? You and I work together too. But how would others find you? Because like, you know what? You definitely do give a peace of mind and you know, you know your you understand your stuff, you know the dog's body language, you understand how your feelings and your body language can affect our dogs too. You've been through it over and over. So how can you share your page with others? <laughs> well, the thank you very much, Suzanne. I really appreciate that. <laughs> um, you're the one who's been such a big help in educating me further as I as I carry on here. 
Um, but you can find me on Instagram at uh, Positive Pet Care by Bianca. And you can email me at contactpositivepetcare at gmail.com. Amazing stuff. That's what I, I we will have to have you on the show again. Like this is it. huge. Like like just from listening today, like shedding a light, like just letting people know the the real life of a reactive dog and not all dogs need to be said hello to. Like we really want to just help the people in Toronto get those numbers down. We don't need those horrible statistics for dog bites and a lot of them are unprovoked, but amazing information. We'll put all the details into our show notes that you'll be able to find on the dot dog. That will be up tomorrow. So Bianca, thank you so much for joining us today. It was absolutely That was so awesome, Susanna. It's amazing. Like like the reality of just being a reactive dog walker, reactive dog owner, and hearing it from her point of view and speaking up for the dogs and educating, like, just love it. So following on from that, you are a dog trainer. You are the founder of I Speak Dog. So what would you suggest for these guys who have a reactive dog? What's the best way to approach it from the training angle? So first and foremost, I would say get your energy and the body weight in check. You know what, dogs are going to feed off of what we do as well. So if it helps, I would cleanse that I've used, that I've had before, I would put like, visuals, take a deep breath, you know, visualize this, visualize that, and just be aware of your own surroundings, right? Space is your friend. When you have a reactive dog, space is your friend, I would say, right? And then... <laughs> Before I even get into kind of conditioning, I got to say some of my favorite, favorite, favorite training techniques for reactivity. You just gotta like understand that the dog is having a really hard time. They're not doing this to get you angry. They're not doing this to hear um, myself. I think you might have a little bit of feedback, but we're okay on. I can I can hear you okay. Oh, that's worse. <laughs> that's worse. Okay. Yeah. Speak up. How about now? How about now? Yeah, yeah, you're okay. Okay. It's a little low, but I can hear you okay. Okay. So the thing is, um, they're not out there to make our lives horrible, terrible, whatnot. Dogs that are reactive are having a really hard time self-regulating, right? So, again, if you're feeling frustrated, imagine how they're feeling. That's all I got to tell you. And 99% of activity comes from fear. That's the thing. And if your dog is scared, we have to have techniques that work for your dog, right? So, um, after conditioning and gradual exposure. I hear feedback like crazy now. I don't know why. No, you're, you're sounding okay on my end. Because I keep hearing myself. Keep hearing myself. No, you are, you are fine. Okay. You, you're going to have to power through hearing yourself. Okay. Uh, so counter conditioning is one of my favorite strategies. I've been using this for years in humans and in dogs. Um, for anxiety. So um, for building confidence and by exposing dogs to shippers from a safe distance. So counter condition is uh, changing the emotion and the dog's behavior about triggers. So you are trying to teach the dog to associate something that's not pleasant with something that's pleasant. So like triggers, something that's pleasant, right? So for example, the sound of a doorbell or playing with toys, the dog absolutely loves to do. So treats need to be given in the next instance, so right away. So the key component here is your dog needs to see the trigger. As soon as your dog sees the trigger, you need to give treats right away to counter condition uh, their natural emotion, and natural reaction. The natural emotion would be like fear, and then, oh, I must bark, I must attack, right? right. So a lot of people fail to understand too that dog bark, also what works for them, right? So if a dog barks, the dogs are going to be doing this more and more in the future, right? So their barking will not stop until the triggers are here. So 
this is why we're trying to change their emotion and change their behavior. So reinforcement must be something that the dog is absolutely crazy about. Not what you think the dog is crazy about, but what, what the dog shows that he or she would absolutely want to kill for, right? So this treat probably is not going to be something that you give every single day. So we need to find something that's super high value. Like for Kingly, he used to be raw steak, raw fish, you know? So he absolutely loved that. So when I was exposing him to street cars, to loud noises outside, we did it from a huge distance first, where he would hear the trigger, he would see the trigger, but not be stressed to like react to that. Um, and also, one of my pet peeves is when people are like, oh, does my dog have to sit, or I'm going to get my dog to sit or lay down. I'm like, I don't care what your dog does in that, in that moment, right? As long as he doesn't react, we're good to go. The dog doesn't have to sit. Your dog knows how to lay down. Your dog is not able to self-regulate. So I ask yourself, are we teaching them commands, or are we teaching them regulation, right? And this is something that I'm super passionate about because... People just don't understand. I'm not trying to do unfortunately. They're like, oh, if we get them to sit down or if we distract them, I'm like, it's not teaching self-regulation. You're, you're masking the problem. You're masking those triggers so your dog will not know what your dog is getting treated for. Mm -hmm. and, and I know living in the city, too, sometimes you have to start treating before they see the trigger because, you know what, they're getting out, right? If they're in a building and you're scared other people are going to see your dog is aggressive, you're going to be masking those triggers. But then you need to get out and you need to start exposing them to those triggers at their own distance, right? So what I mean by same distance is, I did say it a little bit, I'm going to repeat it again. The distance needs to be where the dog can see the trigger but does not feel threatened by that trigger, right? So you start exposing them at that distance. And your dog is your best critic. Your dog is your best feedback giver. You know why? Go ahead. Because I was asking, I was testing you. <laughs> <laughs> because your dog will bark, your dog will react. If you're too slow, your dog's gonna tell you you're too slow. I need more treats, I'm barking, you know, triggers right there. If you're too close, your dog's gonna react and treats won't work then. Right? You, know, you could throw a steak on the ground and it ain't gonna work. God no, because that's an emotional response then, right? Like it's not, you know, it's not gonna change it, right? So this is where I come in, right? So I would come in and I would show, I would model, I would let you know how your dog is feeling. I would get you to recognize mm -hmm. how your dog's body language is, right? I would get you, I would coach you. I would let you know, too slow, too fast, right on, mm -hmm. perfect, right? How many treats to give, right? But I would show that before I would put you with your dog to do that, right? Because like, again, you know, I would also model yourself to like your body language, how your body language is like as well at the same time because you know what what you do with that hand or this hand or sometimes you say oh oh there's another dog that's a trigger for your dog this is where your dog gets hyped up even more right so i would say make sure the number one thing is to make sure that your dog is aware of the trigger but not stress mm -hmm. if your dog is barking growling jumping then you are too close or you are just too slow with treats right so you kind of have to gauge that as well um i would say some tips to watch out for is to keep in mind, start at a distance. And again, distance, distance, distance is your friend mm -hmm. where your dog feels safe and sees the trigger. If your dog reacts, that means he or she is close to the trigger or you are too slow with those treats, right? Have extremely high value treats. So again, this is what your dog considers to be high treats, not what you consider your dog likes, right? That's important to distinguish because what you see as high value is not what your dog sees as high value, right? The, the way you can that is they can go to the dog store and let them pick out their own stuff. Mm -hmm. Watch your body, your dog's body language. Your dog will tell you if he's uncomfortable. So that you can see it in their, in their faces, their head. You can see it with their body language too. Uh, so like stiff, uh, ears all the way up, uh, agonistic putter, pucker, right? I always tell when you're angry, your lips are more like pronounced. You're like, you know, so it's the same thing in dogs as well. Um, so watch for that body language. Watch for what you say, like your cues, uh, your body language, your sounds, what you do with your hands. This is why I love those leashes that go around your waist because then your hands don't do the talking. It's your waist, right? Like it's a different story. Mm -hmm. um, 
start with least to most exposure. So like one or two triggers at a time versus like, let's overwhelm them, right? Start with, don't overdo it with training. Um, end your training session on a positive note always because even if your dog reacts super well to so many triggers because you're counter conditioning and exposing your dog to those triggers, that doesn't mean that your dog might not react at the end of the training session. Because again, if what we talked about, trigger stacking, right? You need to just start with low and end it on a positive note, right? Because you want your dogs to associate positive with an aversive situation, right? And I always tell everybody, take a deep breath, right? Take a deep breath. It, it all starts with you as well, right? Take a deep breath and relax. Stay calm and practice where you have distance around you, right? So you're not in a closed area, small space because that gives you a way out, right? Another thing, important thing that I wanted to mention too is don't pull your dog's leash. Do not tighten their leash. Do not grab them by their collars. I've seen trainers do that. What can happen if you do that? The dog can just snap at you. So please don't do that. Your dog's already stressed enough and you need to stop like your dog even more, right? And do not punish your dogs for this. Your dogs are telling you they're stressed, it's anxiety, it's huge trigger, do not punish your dogs for communicating stress to you, right? Use counter conditioning, use gradual exposure, which is distance, stay distance, to expose your dogs to this. Please contact me if you have any questions, concerns. I can answer all of your questions. I can even come. I can demonstrate for you. Um, so we can just go from there, right? And another safety point that I wanted to say too is I would put always myself in between my dog and the trigger, right? Your dog will feel a lot safer when you're in between that scary thing when you're doing counter conditioning. But again, do it side by side so your dog can kind of, you know, feel you there too. You were there too. Sorry, Pam. I felt like I took over. I got passionate <laughs> about it. I, you know, started talking and talking and talking. I just want to make sure that people understand that no punishment for counter conditioning mm -hmm. further when you're dealing with dogs that are reactive. Please don't punish your dogs. It is not a response to be punished. It's an emotional response to the outside environment, lack of socialization, lack of training. It can be a lot of things, right? And what would happen if you punished the reactivity? What would tend to happen then? Well, people think it magically solves problems because it will stop the behavior, but is your dog self-regulating? No, it's gonna come out somewhere else. Your dog's gonna to get to a point where your dog's gonna just explode and, and bite somebody, react on someone else, right? Mm -hmm. um, because again, the reason why I say don't punish and the reason why I say don't mask the trigger is because we're teaching your dog to look at the trigger and be okay with it. Not mm -hmm. to uh, not look at the trigger, get punished for it, or get treats for not looking at the trigger. And what are you teaching them? You're not teaching them stuff like you. You're teaching them to pay attention to you. I My dog can pay attention to me. But I'd rather than self-regulate in a stressful environment and then pay attention to me afterwards once they learn to self-regulate. Mm -hmm. And you you touched on the treats. Now tell people what high-value treats are and what high-value treats aren't. So high value treats are anything the dog literally will do anything for something that they don't get on a daily basis either because it loses the value right so kibble unless your dog who absolutely loves food loves 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 food i would say then use kibble that could be a high value treat but i would say a bone from a butcher store right it can be not the pet store because it's too many like chemicals in it like i wouldn't suggest that at all for some dogs it's peanut butter with a tongue for some dogs it's just treats for some dogs it's raw treats right for some dogs it's social attention right some dogs are not food. and in those kind of scenarios distance is your friend the more distance you have the better it is until your dog learns you know what those dogs are not going to do anything to me it's slowly move closer and closer right and again, let go of those expectations that your dog needs to be perfect. Mm -hmm. We're not perfect. Your dog's not going to be perfect. If you're having an off day where you're screaming all the time, your dog's going to react to, trust me. Because they absorb our energy, they're going to do the same thing. I always joked about this. I'm like, if I'm PMSing, Kingsley's going to PMS. And little bit <laughs> I know. 
It's, it's so true. And that's the same even when we were talking about the nails earlier. Like, it's so easy for them to pick up on our energy. So yes. what, would, what would you tell people are signs that the session isn't going well and you need to end it or how long a session should be when they're trying to set it up that the dog is working under threshold? You know what? Uh, your dog is your best critic and your best feedback giver, right? So if your dog is not engaged, if your dog's reacting on every little thing, things that the dog would not react to normally, that's in response to trigger stacking, right? So mm -hmm. I would say end and that's it, right? Like end on the last positive kind of thing that you had with your dog with other triggers in you and just go home. Don't mm -hmm. put limits on yourself saying, like, no, I must do it for an hour, right? Like my training sessions are usually an hour. But if your dog is having a hard time, you know what? We're going to spend an hour and a half next time and I'll stay half an hour or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Don't push your dog beyond their limits because your dogs are going to even create even a more negative association with those triggers than they mm -hmm. already have, right? So if your dog is reacting, if your dog seems unengaged, if those treats do not seem to be working, you need to take a step back and reevaluate the situation. That means triggers too close, treats are not high value, you might not feel okay. Like, think about it. Like, how do you feel before you go out and start training your dog, right? Because that can have a huge impact on what's happening with your dog. Same with, like, if your dog just had a negative day, like, just starting out, too. Like, with Kingsley, oh, my gosh. Like, with him, if he heard somebody fighting in front of our door, this dog would not want to go outside. He would just, his whole day would be thrown off. Mm -hmm. So, like, any sort of kind of factor can have an effect on training. So, just be mindful of your body language, your environment, your dog's body language. Even if your dog is sick, that can also have a huge negative impact on your dogs as well. Because your dog's going to react more. Yeah. If you have a headache, how do you feel? When people just normally like, you know, annoying. Like you can tolerate people to a certain distance, um, to a certain degree. But if you're feeling sick, are you going to be more snappy at them? Or are you just going to be like, hey, I'm so friendly? Yeah. It, it, it's so common sense, but... When people just hear from you, it's just, yeah. And that's what, when you say work for stuff, will you work for 50 cents? Will you work for $5? Will you work for $50? Will you work for $100? You need to find out what it is that your dog will work for. And what your dog wants, not what you want, right? And, and I've heard so many people say, well, but my dog loves socks. I'm like, yeah, mine does too. But when there's a trigger outside, let me tell you, she won't care for those socks. <laughs> she won't care for something bloody, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> that is just preach it preach it like because that is it your dog might love socks in their off time when they're making their own entertainment but yeah. when they see the trigger that is not going to wave in a sock he's like like they don't even see the sock because they're probably going above threshold and the priority is not the sock so the thing unless, is you are competing with something stronger outside right you've got to find something strong to compete with it, right? Mm -hmm. That is, that is it. But guys, if you want to find out more, you can follow Susanna at I Speak Dog on Instagram, or you can go to her website, ispeakdog.ca. She has so many videos on there. If you want to go have a look, check them out. There are so many resources yourself if you want to go check out Grisha Stewart's um, behavior adjustment training. That's a lot of what um, Susanna will be talking about, about how to do your setups how to know when to give the treat, all that kind of stuff. If you can't afford a trainer, there is definitely lots of resources out there, especially like Bianca was even saying, just to know your own dog's body language. There's so much free out there, just the Facebook groups. There is so much free education out there that we don't have any excuse for not being able to learn and educate ourselves a little bit more. It also, this is your time. Absolutely. I totally agree with you. And I would say, you know what? I would, I want to talk about how to find a good trainer for our next topic, actually. Because mm -hmm. I feel like th there's a huge misconception between trainers, too. And um, I would say um, there's a lot of trainers that have no clue how to counter condition and how to do these things. And mm -hmm. I just and, and they just want to punish. So I just kind of want to talk about that next time, if that's okay. Like, because we could literally go on and on and on. Oh, yes. <laughs> We're already well over time again. Oh, gosh. 90 minutes. <laughs> so, guys, that is it for today's show. I want to thank you all for watching and for those who are listening. Huge thank you to Bianca from Positive Pet Care for giving us some awesome tips for handling reactive dogs and being the person on the street when you come across a reactive dog. 
huge thank you to my lovely co-host Susanna again. Um, we would literally stay here all day if we could. <laughs> yes. So, guys, if you want to be on the show, if you want us to discuss a certain topic, there's always stuff out there in the news. We and then there's stuff that we just don't hear that might be doing the rounds on social media. So, if you if there's anything you want us to talk about, if your dog has a great story, if they're a therapy dog. And even if they're a reactive dog, I'd love to have somebody on who owns a reactive dog and come on and tell people how hard it is to have a reactive dog and a day in the life of a reactive dog and a reactive dog owner. So you can go on over to the barkshow.dog. You can also reach us at torontodogwalking.com or you can go to at Toronto Dog Walking on Instagram. And the same for Suzanne, you can reach her at I Speak Dog on Instagram and I Speak Dog.ca. So guys, reach out to us. We we always love to hear from everybody. Even if you're watching the replay, we will be coming back in and checking in on comments. So until next week, guys, we will see you then. Bye for now. Bye.